Express with just a touch away. Monday to Friday at 12.30 p.m. Only on Bloomberg Quint. Good morning. You're watching All You Need to Know on Bloomberg Quint. I'm Darshan Mehta. Let's see what happened as far as the global markets were concerned. Uh, steady consolidation as far as the U.S. markets were concerned. Uh, the indices were up anywhere between four tenths of a percent to close to one and a half, over one percent in trade. Europe uh, finally resumed after a few days of break, and that uh, uh, started on a negative note. So most of the European markets ended with a negative bias. Uh, Asia at this point of time is slightly mixed. The, mixed, uh, the Nikkei is down almost half a percent in trade. The Hong Kong markets have managed to move up, and uh, they're trading absolutely flat. And trade, and that's also what's being indicated by the SCX Nifty. Uh, we have still almost uh, one and a half hours to go, but at this point of time, the SCX Nifty is indicating a slightly muted outlook at this point of time. As far as the ADRs are concerned, most of the ADRs ended with a negative bias. Vedanta, Tata Motors, ICICI Bank, and Dr. Eddies, all of them were down in trade. What managed to gain was Infosys Wipro as well as HDFC Bank. How did we pan out in trade yesterday? It was a decent day for our markets. Again, the Nifty managing to outperform the broader markets, the mid cap and small cap end of the market also doing well. The Nifty Bank was slightly weak in trade. The Nifty Bank was down almost half a percent and the PSU Banking Index was also half a percent and this was mainly on account of Kotak Mahindra Bank and HDFC Bank being down in trade. Despite, uh, this, uh, despite the move of that we saw on the broader markets, the FI has bought in 1700 crores in the cash market. DI has sold in 663 crores uh, in trade yesterday. How did the Nifty pan out? We were up almost 50 points. Reliance, Infosys, ITAC and HDFC managed to move up while the banks, HDFC Bank and Kotak Bank were weak in trade. Maru and SBI were the other contributors on the negative side. On the FNO side, what we saw was the fact that on the Nifty side, again, uh, we are uh, seeing open interest build up of 25% on the long side. Uh, we are coming in close to the 10,800 mark in trade. The Nifty Bank is now actually trading, uh, uh, was trading down in trade yesterday, so that one saw the slight weakness that came in. As far as where positions are taken uh, on, on the call side, we are seeing that from 10,800 to higher levels, call writers are active. And at lower levels, uh, what we are seeing is the fact that that from 10,700 to 10,400, the put writers are active in trade. As far as what happened in trade, uh, what we are seeing is that call writers are active from 10,800 and 10,900 uh, in this new series. As far as uh, the stocks in the FNO ban is concerned, what we are seeing is that Atari Power so open it, uh, is the only stock in the FNO ban at this point of time. Uh, the PCR for the Nifty managed to move up since the Nifty was strong in trade, but that was in the case for the Nifty Bank that was slightly weak in trade. Couple of stocks that managed to move in trade yesterday. If First of all, was PC Dwellers. Open interest built up was high. Uh, the counter managed to move up almost 5% uh, in trade. The other counter which managed to move up was Coal India. And despite trading at a discount, the counter managed to move up on decent open interest build up. The two other counters I want to focus on is JSPL. Fresh short positions were taken on the counter. And finally, the last stock that I want to highlight is Ajanta Pharma. Uh, in a weak pharma session, uh, Ajanta Pharma was one of the stronger counters that managed to inch up in trade. So, but these are all the domestic cues. Let's go across to Kathleen Hayes for all the top international headlines. U.S. consumer confidence slumped in December to the lowest since July, the latest sign Americans are growing less optimistic. At the same time, the share of people expecting more jobs in the next six months had its biggest fall since 1977. The report from the New York-based conference board says the declines reflect increasing concern that economic growth is going to slow in the first half of next year. Saudi Arabia has kept key supporters of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in their cabinet jobs in the first major government shakeup since the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The ministers of finance, energy, economy and trade retained their positions in a decree issued by King Salman. The king also promoted several young royals, many of whom have worked with the 33-year-old heir to the throne. Italy's populist government is racing to push its budget bill through Parliament by the year-end deadline. A controversial tax increase for charities is the latest hurdle to be cleared. Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte held a press conference later ahead of a final lower house vote on the bill on Saturday. If Italy misses the deadline, it must use a special procedure to revert back to this year's budget. 
Elon Musk has asked a judge to throw out a defamation lawsuit by the British cave diver the Tesla founder called a pedophile. Musk's lawyers say the Twitter attack on Vernon Unsworth was simply part of a schoolyard spat on social media that wouldn't be taken seriously by any reasonable person. They also argued that even if offensive, such speculative insults were opinion protected by the First Amendment. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Kathleen Hayes. This is Bloomberg. Everyone I've worked with in the last 10 years who's been responsible for India has always been bullish on India. <laughs> you say the market's up. Uh, the market's up on uh, local currency terms. But if you're very critical about things, and perhaps I'm a bit overcritical about things, I look at the return in US dollar terms so far this year, I look at the P multiple, and I look at the earnings growth. And on dollar terms, well, actually, the market hasn't done that well because the currency's been quite weak this year. Mm. The other thing, as you say, is that the market's all about what's going to happen tomorrow. The earnings growth forecast for Indian companies are more than 20% next year. So yes, if the growth does come through, then the market does look attractive. But time and time again, we have these enormous earnings growth forecasts which fail to materialize. So from that perspective, it's not a very cheap market. There are cheaper markets in the region. Yeah, uh, we're just going to show a chart here as well about uh, the PE for India, still very much at a valuation premium with, you take a look at the rest of EMs here, so I guess any kind of upside, at some would say, is still limited. But you've also mentioned before that it's still quite insulated from some of the macro events that we have seen. Yeah, I think there's two or three factors at work. One is actually looking at the, the players in the domestic equity market. What we're seeing now is that domestic institutions are now driving uh, I guess the movements and trading activity in that market. Back in 2010, when I came to Asia, the, the, the Indian market was dominated by the foreign institutions. That's changing now. So we're seeing a lot of local money participating in the market. That's a good thing. And I think from the perspective of the external economy, if you think about what's going on in the region vis-a-vis -vis China and the US, the trade war, for example, India is quite insulated from that. A lot of the stocks are very localized in terms of domestic demands. Companies like Hindustan Unilever, for example, on something like 50 times earnings, but it's all driven by domestic activity. So that's a good thing. There were nearly a thousand exclusions that were put through today on everything from that to marine engines. Um, this isn't like this isn't like the thing, but this is one of those things that you say, right, this had to happen as we're going through if we're actually really going to have a thaw. Um, so let's let's say that this was a step down the yellow brick road toward those trade talks that we're pointing toward. Um, you know, certainly I think traders are looking for any signs of a thaw. This is one of those points that you sort of look at. You say, right, this came along. It hit. There's a bigger thing on the horizon about trade uh, exclusions when we talk about the 200 billion line certainly there's a far vaster ocean uh, to pluck from there uh, so we're gonna we've got a lot more to look for here but uh, encouraging signs a little bit of a post Christmas present for uh, for everybody Crude oil prices continue to trend on the lower side, with Brent crude falling more than 4% uh, on Thursday over lingering concerns of a supply glut and slowdown in economic growth. Uh, this comes after the Russian energy minister told reporters uh, in Moscow that it may ramp up production in the second half of 2019, uh, even, uh, even under the current OPEC agreement to cut output. Uh, meanwhile, uh, crude oil prices they came under further pressure after a surprise report suggested an increase in U.S. crude inventories. Uh, mixed cues coming in from the base metals space with aluminum prices falling for a fourth consecutive day uh, down about two percent on thursday nickel are uh, down one percent as well copper and zinc they snapped their respective three-day losing streak uh, while lead prices they hit a two-month high on the other hand we are seeing more strength coming in for the gold prices with spot gold uh, trading near its six-month high as prices uh, increased for a second consecutive week uh, on the back of uh, financial volatility market volatility uh, political turmoil and concerns that global growth may be slowing down well, a bunch of news that we're tracking this morning. I'm going to start off with Lemon Tree first. Wabus Pinkus has inked a 3,000 crore joint venture with uh, the company to co to offer co-living space. The joint venture with this, the company enters into uh, a new segment, which is the rental housing accommodation space. The JV partners initially will get an investment of around 1,500 crore, which will be spent over the period of time, uh, period of years. Further, which where where the option of around 1,500 crore will be available, Wabuk would hold around. 
68% stake in the company, while Lemon Tree would hold 30% stake. Next in the list, we are tracking Consignero Lac, which has entered into a share pack agreement with Perma Construction Eats for a consideration of around 30 odd crore. Relatively a small, uh, a relatively a small acquisition that we're looking at, and the deed is expected to be completed by Jan 28th. Vapco India has clarified that it's not the company but the parent which has actually gone ahead and signed a $950 million supply pact with commercial vehicle maker. Also, we're looking at HCC, which has managed to raise in uh, a, a sum of around 500 odd crore via right issue. With this, the promoter stake now increases to 33% from 27% earlier. And last on the list, we're looking at Indazan Bank, where CLSA's Chris Wood has cut in the weightage on this particular counter in his model portfolio by as much as one percentage points. The government has initiated the process of infusing additional capital uh, in public sector banks as it had promised a few days ago. Uh, at least six public sector banks are received, uh, set to receive additional capital uh, according to what bankers are telling us. Of these six, Bank of India is set to receive about 10,000 crore which is the highest amount uh, among all of these banks. Uh, uh, so subsequently, Yuko Bank will receive about 3,000 odd crore. Uh, Bank of Maharashtra will receive about 4,500 crore. Uh, while United Bank informs stock exchanges that it is set to receive about 2,160 crore. Now, remember that all of this, all of these funds will help these banks meet the minimum capital requirement as is stipulated under Basel III guidelines, uh, of the, uh, which the Reserve Bank of India had implemented in the banking system. Uh, However, all of these banks are under the uh, prompt corrective action uh, framework of the Reserve Bank of India and are facing considerable uh, uh, lending restrictions, which does not allow them to expand their corporate book uh, beyond a certain limit. Uh, now, while this money will not help them come out of the PCA framework, it will certainly help them enter the new financial year uh, with a stronger footing, because once the capital part of it is taken care of, uh, then the banks can focus on improving the profitability uh, by reducing the level of bad loans on their books. Now, the government has a few days ago an, uh, uh, sought uh, permission from the parliament to infuse about an additional amount of 41,000 crore into parasitic banks. Uh, this amount of 41,000 crore is in excess of the 2 lakh odd crore worth of recapitalization plan uh, that uh, the government had announced back in October 2017. Uh, much of this entire amount, uh, about 2.5 lakh crore, will be in the form of recapitalization bonds, especially this additional 41,000 crore is entirely in the form of recapitalization bonds, uh, because of which the government contends uh, that it is going to be fiscal neutral since there is no amount being transferred from the government accounts uh, to these public sector banks. However, experts point out that the government will have to pay interest on all of these bonds uh, to the banks that are receiving them, and therefore that will impact uh, its fiscal status. If you look at consumer, I think one of the big broad trends you are seeing is definitely the rise of e-commerce. And again, we saw various regulators now getting more active as we just saw in India. Uh, beyond that, I think from a consumer standpoint, we are seeing Southeast Asia itself growing at a very rapid pace. Right? Last year, we saw more than 37% growth just on the gross merchandise volume, which is the actual products which are bought over e different e-commerce platforms. And we expect this to continue. And one of the other emerging trends because of e-commerce is the retail omnichannel convergence. So what's happening also is that the traditional retailers who were struggling with the e-commerce growth now are also realizing that they need to use or leverage e-commerce a little lot more effectively. And we are seeing traditional mom and pop retailers now getting to e-commerce in a big way. And there's a new trend emerging where we're calling omnichannel commerce, where the traditional retailers are trying to figure out what's the new e-commerce mean for them. But again, riding on from e-commerce, one of the other consumer trend which we see is the rise of the sharing economy. Again, I think we had the likes of Airbnb, Ubers, Grab starting off. But that that is spilling over and we are seeing a lot more uh, sharing economy platforms being used and that is also leading to another trend which is around integrated payment platforms using all these different sharing economy. So we are seeing different kind of payment companies, again Alipay getting very aggressive, Grab starting its own wallet and that payment yeah. itself will be a big force to reckon with in APAC when we look at 2019. So Ajay, uh, based on everything that you mentioned there, does it seem like it, this is simply a big boy playground or should I expect a up and coming company in any of these major trends to to make headway next year or is it just the same names with the, the pockets? Yeah. 
So again, I think consolidation will be a big, again, if you look at e-commerce, there is a big challenge in the sense of profitability. Uh, e-commerce is, is turning out to be the way the current business models are stacked, it's turning out to be a big boy's game, as you rightly said. So the, the higher uh, the volumes, the bigger the profitability, and again, you're, that's one of the trends which we expect is many of the smaller e-commerce companies might fold up or consolidate with the bigger names here in the region, at least in APAC. We are expecting that trend. Right? But at least profitability is becoming important, and that's where I think most of the e-commerce companies are now taking a relook at their model. Uh, what kind of model works for us? Again, there's no point in burning money um, just to stay just to stay relevant or just to increase the top line. But what kind of new niches should we target? And that's where you see luxury e-commerce, for example, one of the segments which is coming up big in APAC, which relatively is much more profitable than the traditional e-commerce. Right? So you'll see that. Uh, you'll see, again, a lot of big boys uh, consolidating or acquiring the smaller players, and a lot of smaller players who are struggling Link, folding up in the at least in the e-commerce space, we're expecting that for sure. On the big brokerage calls for the day, first we have is MK on Ashok Leland. Now the brokerage has downgraded the rating on Ashok Leland to hold from Binance at the target price 213 from 152. Now, according to the company, brokerage's channel check, a reversal has been seen in the MHCV sales cycle driven by surplus capacity, increasing cost of ownership, selective financing by NBFC, and because of a high base. Now, along with this, the product mix has also turned adverse for Ashok Leland due to implementation of the new axle load norms as customers have now shifted on low tonnage trucks. Now in the CV space, Ashok Leland has also lost market share to Tata Motors as the competitive intensity has increased due to subdued volumes and aggressive marketing seen by Tata Motors. Lastly, the brokerage is expecting pre-buying uh, due to implementation of BS6 norms to support volume growth in FY20, but for FY21, it is expecting volume growth to be negative for Ashok Leland. The second note we have is on MK on two wheelers. And according to the brokerage, the subdued festive season is now behind and going forward, it is expecting the two wheeler volumes to recover gradually. Now it is expecting 11% growth when it comes to volume for FY20 and a 5% growth for financial at 2021. Now for Aisha Motors, they have upgraded the rating to buy from Accumulate and have hiked the target price to 27,700 from 25,700. For Hero Motor, they have downgraded the rating to hold from buy and have cut the target price to 3350 from 3560 due to market share losses, lower volumes and lower margin expectations by the brokerage. For TVS, they have maintained the accumulate rating and have hiked the target price to 595. For Bajaj Auto, they have maintained the accumulate rating and have hiked the target price to 2910. Lastly, the brokerage says that the new product launches remains the key focus area for the OEMs as it will not only support replacement demand but also market share gains for the two-wheeler companies going forward. Thank you.